recap just briefly from last week. We covered the first portion of Judges chapter 2 last week, and it kind of helps us to, to refresh and to set our bearings for this week. So we saw last time the angel of the Lord comes up from Gilgal to uh, Bochim, which has historically been identified with the town of Bethel. And so we noted a few things that grab our attention with that. And one is the, that the angel of the Lord visits his people uh, as either as in mass or with representatives of each tribe there at Bochim. And it's significant that God speaks to the people directly, and there's a message deliver, delivered that is a, a harsh one. There's a harsh message that God has for the people about their forgetfulness and their unfaithfulness. So we, we noted last time that this message is significant in three elements. The location, where the angel of the Lord starts and ends, that, that journey has significance. There's also significance to his message. And also the fact, thirdly, that he is physically present. Warren Wearsby says that God, the fact that God himself came to give the message shows how serious things had become in Israel. Why is this so significant? I think um, it helps to kind of set our bearings here for a second. So the whole promise, going all the way back to Abram, that God has for his people is that essentially, I'm going to bring you into a new land. I'm going to relocate you, you know, and, and that's what God does. He, even to this day, he, um, we could say he repositions his, tr- his troops. He, he puts people in places where he wants us, and he has put you for now where he wants you. You're, you're in this general area because God brought you here. He has you here. He wants you here. He has a mission for you here until he says otherwise. And the the promise remained for God's people to go into this land, the land of Canaan, and and the patriarchs, they they got to dwell there as sojourners. They went camping for an extended time. And then they went into slavery in Egypt, and then God reiterated that covenant promise, I am absolutely going to bring you out of this slavery, and I'm going to put you into this wonderful land I have promised for you, the promised land, the land of Israel. And so they, the people struggled with this, and eventually when God did it, the hope throughout the, the history of the nation of Israel is that they would take full advantage of that. But the sad reality was that through fear, through sinfulness, through forgetfulness, through a lot of different things, They failed to live up to the promise which was theirs to have. They didn't seize the land and and occupy it and experience its rest and take advantage of it like they could have. So the angel of the Lord comes to them and and delivers this message. Um, It's a hard-hitting message, but it's the message they needed. And you know, sometimes that's how it is with us too. That God gives us the hard-hitting message that's uncomfortable. That, you know... It could be different for me, for you, each of us. We're all unique. Our circumstances are unique. And God deals with us as individuals. And sometimes it's a blow to our pride. Sometimes it's um, the, the reality check that there's something that's out of whack that we need to fix. And so after reminding the people of Israel here in the first part of chapter 2 of what he had done so miraculously and powerfully for them in the past, the angel of the Lord declares God's absolute rock-solid, steadfast, covenant faithfulness, saying, I will never break my covenant with you. God made a covenant with them, and he was never, ever about to break it. That's not in his character. He doesn't break covenants. And I think that's one of the sad things that we need to look out for, is the idea that somehow God is lax. He took too long. He must have forgotten or, well, you know, he must have just had to adjust on the fly and, and change things up and switch things up. That's not his character. It's not who he is. So before his death, in verse 7, we're reminded of the fact that Joshua had led the nation in renewing their covenant with the Lord, and they were all in. Yeah, 
That's us. That's where we're at. We're going to do that. And then as we see the rest of the chapter unfold, we see that they quickly, from just one generation to the next, abandon that. We see in the next younger generation last time, a spiritual indifference to the Lord. They didn't know him in the same way. They quickly uh, were experiencing the draw, the allure of the way of life and the spiritual practices of the Canaanites who they had left in the land, and it began to cause them all kinds of trouble. It began to really suck them into, uh, away from the Lord, we could say. We saw last time there where, where we left off, verses 14 and 15, the anger of the Lord. Actually, just backing up into verse 12, it says they... Let's go back to verse 11. Then the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals, and they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were around them and bowed themselves down to them. Thus they provoked the Lord to anger. So we see God's anger uh, be mentioned there in verse 12 for the first time in this section going to recur many more times. So they forsook the Lord and served Baal and the Ashtaroth. And then again, verse 14, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he gave them into the hands of plunderers who plundered them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies around them so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. Wherever they went, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had spoken and as the Lord had sworn to them so that they were severely distressed. Because Remember, this isn't coming out of left field. God has already warned them that this would happen. Then, if they're unfaithful. Verse 16, then the Lord raised up judges who delivered them from the hands of those who plundered them. So here in these kind of middle of chapter 2 verses, we were introduced to this scenario that's going to repeat itself throughout the book of Judges over and over and over again. The people... We'll just mention it this morning. We'll mention it in more detail next week, um, or maybe two weeks. But uh, the people, they, they abandon the Lord. They go after the gods of the Canaanites. They get completely twisted up, turned around, off base. And, when, and then things start to go bad for them. Things start to go sideways in every single way spiritually, relationally, you know, in terms of their family life, their, their national life, enemies are, are coming in economically, they're just getting destroyed. So many things are problematic in the nation of Israel. Everyone was doing that which they wanted to do in their own eyes. It was chaos. It was anarchy. And so then uh, the people are being oppressed by this, and they, they cry out to the Lord. They're desperate And what does God do? It says right here in these verses, he raised up judges, verse 16, who delivered them from the hands of those who plundered them. So God rescues them. And and from there they have a, a, a reprieve once again. And then after that reprieve, they go back to that same pattern. They walk away from the Lord. They forget about him. They start going after the gods of the Canaanites then things go sideways again, and then they cry out to him, and it's just this vicious cycle that they get caught up in. So last week, we talked about, we're being introduced here in chapter 2 to the consequences, well, I'll put that up here, the consequences of Israel's spiritual failure. So a lot of the consequences that we're seeing are military consequences. Things are going badly with their military campaign to take the land. But the reason we're giving, given here in the text, the underlying reason, is a spiritual one. So we're here right in the opening section. We're getting, uh, we're getting the background of what happened, what was supposed to happen and didn't happen, and then why it happened. So that's, that's where we're at here this morning. We're going to get into the beginning of chapter 3 here. So um, here's where we're at. The people have crossed over the Jordan River right here, um, Gilgal, Jericho, and then from there spread out into the land. And you remember as you've 
um, read, maybe not recently, but hopefully you've read the book of Joshua. And the book of Joshua um, gives this play-by-play of the nation of Israel going through the land and um, taking the battle to the Canaanites, and Joshua was a general's general. He was a warrior and a strong, um, strong on the battlefield, but even stronger as a leader, as a spiritual leader. He led the people in, in closeness with the Lord. He, they were walking with him. They were applying the faith lessons that they had learned through the wilderness and the lessons they're learning as they're moving into the land. And this is all having the effect of making of taking the battle to the Canaanites as God told them needed to happen so that the, the Canaanites were on the back foot. They were on their back heel and unable to, uh, to punch back, to, to push the Israelites out of the land. Once they were in the land, they're in the land. And so Joshua um, destabilized things to such a degree militarily that they had their foothold firmly planted in the land. And so the Canaanites could no longer just attack and and run them out. So they were established. Then what chapter 1 told us is from there, um, God could have used Joshua and the nation to just keep on the offensive, go through all the land and annihilate all the Canaanites. But because of their unfaithfulness, At that point, Joshua dies, God stops giving them the victory, and it becomes incumbent on each one of the 12 tribes to take their own territories. And that's what chapter 1 documented for us, the breakdown there. Uh, They had a little bit of limited success at the beginning with Judah and Simeon uh, taking territory and more or less securing their tribal areas, but all the rest, not so much. So that sets the scene of of where we're at here in chapter 2, verse 16. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hands of those who plundered them. The Hebrew word here is shofetim, and it describes these these people through the book of Judges, who we're going to meet several of them, known as Judges, we generally call them judges, but they were essentially deliverers, they were rescuers, and they were leaders. So the Shofa team, really, we can think of as kind of these ad hoc military leaders upon whom God's Spirit came in order to supernaturally empower them to take successful action on behalf of God's oppressed people. A little definition here of. of these people. They're, they're generally referred to in the plural and judges far more than they are in, in the singular with this specific term. Verse 17, yet they would not listen to their judges, but they played the harlot with other gods and bowed down to them and turned quickly from the way in which their fathers walked in obeying the commandments of the Lord they did not do so. So what we have here is, um, this is kind of an interesting word picture we're given here, that they played the harlot with other gods. And this recurs throughout the Old Testament, the same imagery. It was spiritual harlotry, and in this case, mixed with real actual harlotry. Um, so often was the case. And so, you know, God is, is using this idea of unfaithfulness in terms of prostitution. And verse 18, and when the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who oppressed and harassed them. So as they're suffering, God has compassion and he rescues by way of the judges from the suffering. He, he lifts them out of the immediate problem that they were facing. So here we see God's faithfulness. We see his love. We see his compassion. But we also see that this was for a limited time only. That this lasted basically through the life and ministry of the judge and then it went back again. So this was a temporary reprieve. Um, we have a couple of references here. Verse 17, it says, they, um, 
they turned quickly from the way in which their fathers walked. So this is a reference to the obedient generation of Joshua's day, and we see here a contrast. Then in verse 18, um, we have here that this was, again, just for a limited time, that God would restrain the enemy forces that were often, throughout the book of Judges, the, the enemy forces that Israel was being oppressed by were often superior in numbers and military technology. So that's usually a recipe for disaster on the battlefield. Why it wasn't was because when God was with them, it didn't matter. God's deliverance was not due to the righteous conduct of the nation. Israel uh, was not, they, they cried out out of their misery, but this was, um, it really wasn't a, a repeated or extended degree of repentance that moved God to act. It was because of God's character. And I think this is really important in the book of Judges that God acted because of his attributes, his character, his faithfulness, his committedness. I don't know if that's a word, but committedness, compassion, and mercy. So essentially, God is concerned with longer term, bigger picture things. They're, they're crying out at the moment, you know, we're, we're just getting hammered economically, Lord. We're we're having invading armies coming in and, and harassing our people and um, making life unbearable. We're being enslaved by this people or that people. Lord, we're, we're, just, we're desperate here. So that's their perspective, and it's limited to the, the circumstances of the moment, but God's perspective is at the 10,000-foot level. It's a big-picture perspective. It is the long-term perspective. It's the one that matters the most. And what was that? Well, God's overarching concern was for bigger things, like the long-term sustainability and well-being of his people, his chosen people. What's going to be their best interest in the long term? It was for the land. I mean, that seems kind of a weird one. But the land was important to God. He, he brought them in. He gave them this choice land. It was, was well suited for farming and for animals. And there were all these buildings that they didn't even have to build that were ready to move into and all of these things. And they just had to take advantage of them. And they had to um, go in and, and do what God asked of them. And then they would have the blessing of the land itself. They could utilize it for their benefit, and they could rest on it. There was also the covenant. God was all about the covenant. He'd made a covenant with his people. Back with Abraham, it was an unconditional covenant. He said, I'm going to bring you into this land that I've given you, and it's yours. I'm, I'm promising you, um, you know, what, land, seed, and blessing, these three components of the Abrahamic covenant. And so God is all in, 100% committed to his covenant which he made with his people. It wasn't conditioned on the faithfulness of Abraham and Abraham's descendants. So even if they were completely unfaithful, which they more often than not were, God remained completely committed to that covenant which he had made. He was also concerned with his name, his reputation among the nations. That if, if his people were destroyed, what would that say about him? If his people were continually um, living in idolatry, what would that say about him? And on and on. So despite the nation's um, unfaithfulness and lack of remorse, God takes action on their behalf because he's looking at the longer term, bigger picture. Verse 19. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they reverted and behaved more corruptly than their fathers by following other gods to serve them and bow down to them. They did not cease from their own way of doing things, did they? Their own stubborn way. So here the, the word fathers refers to the previous generation, the one that preceded them in Israel. So verses 1 through 19, the the oppression that they're facing is coming from outside. Foreign invaders 
coming in from outside of Israel. And then that's going to switch in verse 20. And we're going to read about the hardships that they were facing from those enemies that had remained in the land and that they were living among and that they were intermingled with. Then the anger of the Lord, here it is again, third time and not that many verses, was hot against Israel. And he said, Because this nation has transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and has not heeded my voice, I will... I also will no longer drive out before them any of the nations which Joshua left when he died. So um, they blew it, basically. But God is still working. That's, keep that in mind. That's really important. So that through them I may test Israel, whether they will keep the ways of the Lord to walk in them as their fathers kept them. That would be Joshua's faith, uh, generation, the faithful ones, or not. Therefore, the Lord left those nations without driving them out immediately, nor did he deliver them in the hand of Joshua. So again, um, the Lord could have done things differently, but he chose not to. And this is so significant because we see the sovereignty of God, that he is working, even through their unfaithfulness, even through not ideal circumstances, even through a lot of sin and a lot of heartache, God is working. I want us to be encouraged this morning because God is doing the same thing in your life and in my life. That when we get things wrong, when we go astray, when we make a wrong decision, it's not a problem for God. He wants us to follow him obediently and faithfully and seek him every step of the way and stay connected to him in prayer. And he'll guide us in the way that's going to be for our best. But even when we don't, he is absolutely still working. So we have in this verse, in these verses, the people of Israel, um, let's see, where is it? I think it's verse 22. Sorry, let me backtrack here just a teeny bit. Um, here we go, verse 20. Notice the wording here. The anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he said, because this nation has transgressed my covenant. I think there's some, some subtext there. But that's a little telling. That here, the Lord God refers to the nation of Israel, his people, his chosen people here as this nation, instead of my nation. That... There, there seems to be, I think we all do this in language. Um, maybe, you know, your, your, your kids are in trouble. <laughs> this kid of mine, you know, whatever. Um, this people, it's kind of this, this relational distance coming into play that they, they had acted wickedly. They have transgressed God's covenant. They have violated the covenant and brought on themselves consequences. And one of the consequences was that the conquest of the promised land would grind to a screeching halt. Robert Alter, in his um, commentary, writes, Joshua, given his sweeping military success reported in Joshua 1 through 12, might well have conquered the entire land, but he left some of it in Canaanite hands in order to see whether future generations of Israel would be faithful to their God and thus be worthy of taking hold of the rest of the land. So Joshua, um, by God's instructions, had to put the brakes on. Okay, Joshua, you can't. Joshua, I think, what, I, I think he was an amazing general, and he could have just gone in and cleared out the land. That, that wouldn't have been a problem. But for the unfaithfulness of the people, I don't, I don't know. They, they just weren't there. They weren't there spiritually. They weren't doing what they needed to do. So this is... Um, something I, I think is worth highlighting. This is five reasons why. And sometimes, you know, we want to know why. We read scripture and we want to know why. Little kids, they always want to know why. You know, we're going to the store, why? Why are we doing that? Why did God allow the Canaanites to remain in the promised land? Why didn't God just override and just drive them out? Well, we're given at least five reasons. 
Five reasons why God allowed the Canaanites to remain in the promised land. Number one, to punish the nation of Israel because they violated their covenant with him. It was punishment. And had gone and worshipped Canaanite gods, so they'd, they'd really overstepped badly in their unfaithfulness to the Lord. So as punishment, number one. Number two, to test Israel's faithfulness to God. So um, the, the setting goes, they have this constant choice before them, and they can choose to seek God in faithfulness and worship him, or they can continue to go their own way and do what's right in their own eyes and go after whatever seems best to them and get intertwined with the Canaanites living among them and go astray from the Lord. So there's this constant test before them. That's the second reason. Number three, to give the Israelites valuable combat experience. We're going to get to that verse here in just a couple verses. Combat experience, of all things. God uses the Canaanites to help them get better militarily. Number four, to protect the Israelites from the promised land becoming a desolate wilderness until such a time as Israel's population was large enough to fill the whole land. So even though they come in with a million people, they're just, it's such a big parcel of land that um, to really take advantage of the whole land, they just didn't have the population initially to do so. And so large amounts of the promised land could have just become wasteland, could have just become desolate, growing conditions could deteriorate. Um, and number five, wild animals can proliferate when that happens. We get that from Exodus chapter 23. So the fifth reason is, again, to protect the Israelites from the land being overrun with wild animals. So the Canaanites serve a variety of helpful purposes to God's plan for his people. So even though we might think, why? Why, why Lord, did you not just override and just drive the Canaanites out anyway and, and just let the people of Israel um, experience what you promised them, even though they were completely off base in every way, um, primarily spiritually? Um, God could have done that, but we see that there were bigger picture reasons and that even through their unfaithfulness, he is still working. So when we keep this in mind, it helps us to understand who our God is, what he is doing, that he has a purpose, and that we can look to him and his sovereignty. I think that's one of the, the attributes of God that doesn't get the attention it needs. And I say that because, um, you know, maybe you have friends, I have friends that are like really committed Calvinists and I don't have a bone to pick with Calvinism. It's a theological system. It's fine. It's whatever it is. Um, but within that, you'll hear people talk a lot about the sovereignty of God. But unfortunately, they typically stop at salvation. And I think God is absolutely involved sovereignly in our salvation, and that is one of his attributes, and he's working in that way, yes. But it extends to all of how he's working. He's working according to his sovereign purpose and will, and, and he knows what he's doing, and he has the beginning from the end because he's eternal, and he has the big picture, and he's working through all of these amazing things. Okay, um, that gives us a takeaway that I don't want to pass up. That one of the, those five purposes, the second one there is, is God testing his people. He put a choice before them. And they had the option, what were they going to do? Were they going to choose God or were they going to reject him? What were they going to do? So the subsequent generation in Israel failed miserably to learn the lessons God wanted them to learn from the tests that he brought into their lives. They failed God's tests over and over and over again. So what is God's will for us? Well, based on these things that we're just looking at, these five purposes, recognize, first of all, that God is at work in our lives. Number two, understand that first and foremost, we must trust God through the test. When God brings those things into our lives, number one, they're not accidental, they're not happenstance, they're, they're not without purpose. God is, is at work. That means God is at work. Number two, understand that we must learn to trust him through it. And that is super hard. I mean, it's really easy to put up here on a number two uh, list point. But I'm telling you, that's hard for me, it's hard for all of us to learn to trust God through it. Number three, know that God is using the test for our good. 
the thing that makes it a little bit easier to find that trust in him through it is knowing that he's using it for the purposes that is with our best in mind. Number four, realize that God is working through the test to protect us from things of which we are likely not even aware. Number five, remember that we will continue to face the same type of test over and over and over again. It's going to keep coming back and back and back until we finally pass the test. You know, um, maybe you, you took a test in college or high school or you, you, know, you took a driving test or something and you had to take it more than once. Um, you know, sometimes in school, that's not an option. You just fail it, you're done. Um, but sometimes we have extra opportunities and that is how God works is he lets us keep having the test until we pass it. And so we need to be attuned and aware to what he needs us to learn from it and to have our faith in him grow stronger because of it. So with that in mind, by having to fight the Canaanites in battle, this is the, um, the, the, four, the third one of those, this combat experience, the Israelite army would have these battle, these local battles, these skirmishes with these regional enemies, and that's going to ultimately set them up, if you fast forward in Scripture, for the nation to go up against regional powers, Egypt and Assyria, and be able to hold their own against the big boys. So the smaller Canaanite nations provided valuable combat training. You see that in 1 Samuel when David fought against the Philistines. His brothers were out there on the battlefield. They were, they were constantly in these local skirmishes with the Philistines. And in the midst of that, what did they learn? Well, they learned some really important things. They learned military skills and tactics and use of weapons and types of weapons and what we would call battlefield weapons integration, how to use those particular weapons effectively in different scenarios on the actual battlefield. The next one, um, we see that the people of Israel largely wasted their suffering. They didn't pass those tests at the hands of the Canaanites, and it was because they failed to learn the lessons God wanted them to learn from their tests. Um, let's look at in the time we have remaining, chapter 3, we'll just kind of introduce chapter 3. We'll get into it more in the future. Um, Now, these are the nations which the Lord left, that he might test Israel by them. That is, all who had not known any of the wars of Canaan, the, the initial entry into the promised land and those initial wars under Joshua. Now, the next generation didn't fight those wars, and so they have to, um, get to know the Lord. Because the, pre- the, the conquering generation, they got to enter the promised land militarily, but also with a faith perspective. They were getting to know God in the midst of this. They were getting to learn to live by faith. They were getting to rely on him and know him and know his ways. And now this is a new generation. And so the Lord is using the Canaanites to test them in a, on a faith level. Um, verse 2, this was... This was only so that the generations of the children of Israel might be taught to know war, at least those who had not formerly known it. So apparently there were some that did still have war fighting skills, but by and large they did not. Um, Most importantly, you put these two verses together, and what we have here is not only how to fight, not only the military component, but how to fight God's way meaning how to have guaranteed success on the battlefield. And, and you can take this in a very figurative way if you want. Um, there's nothing wrong with that because there's a lot of application here. But specifically lo- limited to this particular um, context, it was actual military battles on the battlefield, and their success was going to depend completely their success came through depending completely on the Lord, who promised to give them the victory if they would do things his way, if they would rely on him, if they would have the perspective of faith that saw what God was doing as more important than the size or the weaponry of the opposing forces, ultimately that didn't matter when they were uh, depending on the Lord, when they were fighting his way. Verses 3 and 4, namely, Five lords of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Sidonians, and the Hivites who dwelt in Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal Hermon to the entrance of 
Hamath. So this is a large swath of the promised land, and the first five there mentioned are the five, um, the five leaders. You could call them like little kings. So Philistia, the, the little area along the lower southern coast of Israel, the promised land, was Philistia, the Philistines. And they had these five cities, Ashdod, Ash, uh, Ashkelon, Ekron, Gath, and Gaza. Um, surprisingly, still in the news today. Um, and these five cities were a pentapolis of Philistine cities, each having their own kings, and they, they worked in unison. They worked in harmony, and they were tough to defeat on the battlefield because of it. We're given a couple of other peoples, the Sidonians. It, so Philistines in the south, si- Sidon in the north at this time. Tyre and Sidon became a little bit better known later on, but at this time Sidon was the prominent city in the northwestern corner of the Promised Land, and it belonged to the Phoenicians. They were a really prolific seagoing people. You might remember Jonah going to Philistia, getting on the uh, ship. He goes to Joppa and gets on a, a ship heading for Tarsus, um, Tarshish. And uh, anyways, that was the Phoenicians. That was their territory, their, their primary city. Their, their capital city was Sidon, and so they were oftentimes referred to as the Sidonians. Uh, keep it on here. And they were left that he might test Israel by them to know whether they would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he had commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. Thus the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And they took their daughters to be their wives, and they gave their daughters to their sons, and they served their gods. So really what you have here at the end of this section is this downward slide, this threefold component. It started off by they, they didn't drive out the Canaanites. Um, then they end up living among the Canaanites. Then they start having children intermarrying with the Canaanites. And then finally, fourth, they serve the gods of the Canaanites. So it's just this really this downhill progression. It starts with one bad decision and it just goes from there. Um, so wrapping this all up, for this morning, uh, what we see emerge among all of this that we really want to take away, well, uh, before we do that, verse 8, I'll just highlight this. Um, this is kind of an interesting wordplay in Hebrew. Um, the Cush uh, Rishathaim, the king of Mesopotamia, is, this is a, a funny kind of Hebrew description, I think more than it is an actual like birth name. Um, it means double evil. <laughs> so double evil, the king of Mesopotamia, the marker, the r- geographical marker is like where the Tigris and Euphrates rivers are. So this is a strong foreign king coming in and occupying for eight years. So um, th- this is a long ways from Judah. So a king from Mesopotamia coming in is flexing his muscles. He is extending his power. He's showing that he can occupy a faraway foreign land which if, if that's the measure by which we define um, a, a nation exercising its uh, superiority over other nations, then there are a number of those nations who have done that for periods of time, and they usually don't last because it's difficult to maintain an overseas empire or a faraway empire. Um, and so this one lasted eight years. With that, um, just to, to kind of t- tie a bow on this for this morning, uh, we're out of time, but... What we see emerging from this, and it's throughout the, the book of Judges as a whole, is that the hero of the book of Judges isn't any of these individual judges. We, we're we're going to get into, you know, Barak and, 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 Sam, and, Deli- and Deborah and Samson and Gideon and, and all the judges that we know so well. And sometimes we think, oh, well, those are the heroes of the book of Judges. But ultimately, the hero of the book of Judges is God. He's the ultimate deliverer. He's the one who empowers those judges. He's the one who the people cry out to him and he intervenes. He's the hero who has compassion. And ultimately, he's working in the long term. He's working the big picture. He's, he's preparing all the circumstances for what he's doing throughout the history of the nation of Israel and ultimately for the Messiah to come. And so throughout the book of Judges, we see God's attributes just sort of rise to the surface. We see his righteousness and his sovereignty, 
and his graciousness and his long-suffering, among so many others. So pay attention to those attributes as we're engaging in this study of the book of Judges. Let's close in prayer, and uh, then we'll have our final song. Father, this morning, we're so thankful for your word. Your written word is so rich, and it's exactly what we need. Father, I ask this morning that you would send us out from here with a perspective that is aware of what you're doing, that you're playing the long game, that you have the big picture in mind, that you have our best in mind. And the Lord, when you bring those tests into our lives, it's because you're testing our faith, it's because you're teaching us who you are, it's because you're teaching us to rely on you, to understand that you know what you're doing, that you have our best interest in mind, that you're working through even sometimes bad decisions and difficult circumstances for our good, for the good of others, and ultimately that you're fulfilling your plan. Lord, that sometimes we wish that you would just make things easy, that you would just take away the problem. But Lord, help us to remain in tune with you and what you're doing. And ultimately, Lord, help us to pass that test so that it doesn't have to keep recurring again and again. Help us to look to you, Lord, and to seek you and your will and your ways and to ask the question, Lord, what, what is this all about? What are you doing? What am I missing? Lord, this is uncomfortable and painful and I don't understand, but help me to trust you through it and help me to learn the lesson. I want to pass this test. Father, this morning we're so thankful for how you work. We're thankful for how you work in each one of our lives and in this local church. Lord, we ask your blessing and guidance as we go forth from here. We ask this all in Jesus' name.